Some six months after I had discontinued the practice, I was awakened one night, or thought I was, when I saw Lincoln standing at my bedside. He said, the world will soon need your services. It is about to undergo a period of chaos, which will cause men and women to lose faith and become panic-stricken. Go ahead with your work and complete your philosophy. That is your mission in life. If you neglect it for any cause whatsoever, you will be reduced to a primal state and be compelled to retrace the cycles through which you have passed during thousands of years. I was unable to tell the following morning whether I had dreamed this or had actually been awake and have never since found out which it was. But I do know that the dream, if it were a dream, was so vivid in my mind the next day that I resumed my meetings the following night. At our next meeting, the members of my cabinet all filed into the room together and stood at their accustomed places at the council table while Lincoln raised a glass and said, Gentlemen, let us drink a toast to a friend who has returned to the fold. After that, I began to add new members to my cabinet. Until now, it consists of more than 50 among them, Christ, St. Paul, Galileo, Copernicus, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, Homer, Voltaire, Bruno, Spinoza, Drummond, Kant, Schopenhauer, Newton, Confucius, Albert Hubbard, Brand, Ingersoll, Wilson, and William James. This is the first time that I have had the courage to mention this. Here, therefore, I have remained quiet on the subject because I knew from my own attitude in connection with such matters that I would be misunderstood if I described my unusual experience. I have been emboldened now to reduce my experience to the printed page because I am now less concerned about what they say than I was in the years that have passed. One of the blessings of maturity is that it sometimes brings one greater courage to be truthful, regardless of what those who do not understand may think or say, lest I be misunderstood. I wish here to state most emphatically that I still regard my cabinet meetings as being purely imaginary, but I feel entitled to suggest that, while the members of my cabinet may be purely fictional and the meetings existed only in my own imagination, they have led me into glorious paths to adventure, rekindled an appreciation of true greatness, encouraged creative endeavor, and emboldened the expression of honest thought. Somewhere in the cell structure of the brain is located an organ which receives vibrations of thought ordinarily called hunches. So far, science has not discovered where this organ of the sixth sense is located, but this is not important. The fact remains that human beings do receive accurate knowledge through sources other than the physical senses. Such knowledge, generally, is received when the mind is under the influence of extraordinary stimulation. Any emergency which arouses the emotions and causes the heart to beat more rapidly than normal may, and generally does, bring the sixth sense into action. Anyone who has experienced a near accident while driving knows that on such occasions, the sixth sense often comes to one's rescue and aids by split seconds in avoiding the accident. These facts are mentioned preliminary to a statement of fact, which I shall now make, namely, that during my meetings with the invisible counsellors, I find my mind most receptive to ideas, thoughts, and knowledge which reach me through the sixth sense. I can truthfully say that I owe entirely to my invisible counsellors full credit for such ideas, facts, or knowledge as I received through inspiration. On scores of occasions when I have faced emergencies, some of them so grave that my life was in jeopardy, I have been miraculously guided past these difficulties through the influence of my invisible counsellors. My original purpose in conducting council meetings with imaginary beings was solely that of impressing my own subconscious mind through the principle of auto-suggestion with certain characteristics which I desired to acquire. In more recent years, 
my experimentation has taken on an entirely different trend. I now go to my imaginary counsellors with every difficult problem which confronts me and my clients. The results are often astonishing, although I do not depend entirely on this form of counsel. You, of course, have recognised that this chapter covers a subject with which a majority of people are not familiar. The sixth sense is a subject that will be of great interest and benefit to the person whose aim is to accumulate vast wealth. But it need not claim the attention of those whose desires are more modest. Henry Ford undoubtedly understands and makes practical use of the sixth sense. His vast business and financial operations make it necessary for him to understand and use this principle. The late Thomas A. Edison understood and used the sixth sense in connection with the development of inventions, especially those involving basic patents in connection with which he had no human experience and no accumulated knowledge to guide him, as was the case while he was working on the talking machine and the moving picture machine. Nearly all great leaders such as Napoleon, Bismarck, John of Arc, Christ, Buddha, Confucius and Muhammad understood and probably made use of the sixth sense almost continuously. The major portion of their greatness consisted of their knowledge of this principle. The sixth sense is not something that one can take off and put on at will. Ability to use this great power comes slowly through application of the other principles outlined in this book. Seldom does any individual come into workable knowledge of the sixth sense before the age of 40. More often, the knowledge is not available until one is well past 50 and this for the reason that the spiritual forces with which the sixth sense is so closely related do not mature and become unstable except through years of meditation, self-examination and serious thought. No matter who you are, or what may have been your purpose in reading this book, you can profit by it without understanding the principle described in this chapter. This is especially true if your major purpose is that of accumulation of money or other material things. The chapter on the sixth sense was included because the book is designed for the purpose of presenting a complete philosophy by which individuals may unerringly guide themselves in attaining whatever they ask of life. The starting point of all achievement is desire. The finishing point is that brand of knowledge which leads to understanding, understanding of self, understanding of others, understanding of the laws of nature, recognition and understanding of happiness. This sort of understanding comes in its fullness only through familiarity with and use of the principle of the sixth sense. Hence. That principle had to be included as a part of this philosophy for the benefit of those who demand more than money. Having read the chapter, you must have observed that while reading it, you were lifted to a high level of mental stimulation. Splendid! Come back to this again a month from now, read it once more, and observe that your mind will soar to a still higher level of stimulation. Repeat this experience from time to time giving no concern as to how much or how little you learn at the time, and eventually you will find yourself in possession of a power that will enable you to throw off discouragement, master fear, overcome procrastination and draw freely upon your imagination. Then you will have felt the touch of that unknown something which has been the moving spirit of every truly great thinker, leader, artist, musician writer, statesman, then you will be in position to transmute your desires into their physical or financial counterparts as easily as you may lie down and quit at the first glance of opposition. Faith versus Fear Previous chapters have described how to develop faith through auto-suggestion, desire and the subconscious. The next chapter presents detailed instructions for the mastery of fear. Here will be found a full description of the six fears which are the cause of all discouragement, timidity, procrastination, indifference, indecision 
and the lack of ambition, self-reliance, initiative, self-control and enthusiasm. Search yourself carefully as you study these six enemies as they may exist only in your subconscious mind, where their presence will be hard to detect. Remember too, as you analyze the six ghosts of fear, that they are nothing but ghosts because they exist only in one's mind. Remember also that ghosts creations of uncontrolled imagination have caused most of the damage people have done to their own minds. Therefore, ghosts can be as dangerous as if they lived and walked on the earth in physical bodies. The ghost of the fear of poverty, which sees the minds of millions of people in 1929, was so real that it caused the worst business depression in this country has ever known. Moreover, this particular ghost still frightens some of us out of our wits.